Bom dia. Um, good afternoon, good day, good talk, everybody who is um, watching us. Welcome with us on our web conference, M&A Brazil. Uh, mergers and acquisitions as opportunity or consequence of the crisis. Let's see what our participants today can tell us. Maybe you can also share your opinion um, with us. How do you feel the market? How do you see it? Um, very nice to have all of you with us. A lot of people um, registered for this web conference. Not everybody is uh, there yet. I am Bettina Sachse from the Latin America Verein, the business association for Latin America. We are based in Germany, in Hamburg, and um, we will start now. I hope everybody is um, hearing and listening to us. Um, you may use also your um, high Eury Cruz, yeah, you may use your Q&A um, square also to put in questions, comments, uh, anytime you want, in any language you want. Vocês podem fazer as perguntas em português, auf Deutsch, in English, as you wish, and then we will pass it also to our um, presenters and try to answer everything that you have. So I would like to uh, Mr. Uh, pass the word also and pass the stage to Ms., uh, Mr. Rubens. Um, Mr. Rubens, Manfredo, are you there? Uh, Manfredo Rubens is the president uh, on um, BASFI or BSF or BASF. Um, the CEO, the president of the regional division South America and he is um, directly with us today from Sao Paulo. Welcome, uh, Mr. Rubens. Yes, good morning. Uh, and good morning to Brazil. Uh, good afternoon to Germany. Bettina, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to speak today at this e event. Of course, uh, a great pleasure for me. Um, my name, uh, you mentioned Manfredo Rubens. I'm uh, 29 years with BASF. Uh, I've worked uh, two times in Germany, three times in the U.S., and now this is my second turn in Brazil. Uh, also, I've uh, worked 25 years of my BSF career in finance and controlling, and I headed uh, global finance uh, of BASF Group, including mergers and acquisitions, for eight years. And uh, for the last five years now, I've been uh, in regional positions uh, and leading regional organizations, so um, two and a half years in uh, North America and uh, now for two and a half years already back in Sao Paulo with uh, great pleasure as the regional president for all of South America. So I'm not um, uh, South Latin America, I'm in uh, the BSF organization responsible for the um, South American organization. So I'm uh, I'm very happy to share with you today um, my view on the economic situation in uh, South America uh, with a little bit of a focus uh, in Brazil, then also provide you some uh, insights uh, about what is happening uh, uh, with BSF in these, in these times. Um, for that, I will step back a little bit and uh, look at the economic situation prior to COVID then uh, talk a little bit about what uh, we see of the situation today, and then try to give a, an outlook, um, uh, at least of some trends that uh, we are perceiving today. Very difficult to make a, a real outlook uh, right now. So let me first comment on the situation until 2019. And uh, the economic environment of South America is driven really by the performance of the two major countries, it's uh, Brazil and Argentina, which make up about two-thirds of the South American GDP. So after years of economic recession with a GDP decline in 2015 and 2016, uh, Brazil then started to really come back to some kind of growth um, at a low level in 2017. And uh, with the new government, 
elected in 2018, um, the, the new administration launched a, a, a really pro-market agenda under the uh, minister of uh, Paulo Guedes with reform plans which at least partly have already been executed. Uh, and here I'd, I'd like to, to mention the uh, s some efforts to reduce bureaucracy, which is a, a big topic on the agenda of the new administration. The pension reform has been um, uh, concluded and the privatization of state-owned companies is another area where the new government has been very active. Uh, also, we then had in 2019 the announcement of the free trade agreement, uh, Mercosur and uh, uh, European Union, which also showed an ambition of the countries to really further open up the traditionally fairly closed markets. But despite the pro-market agenda, the economic growth in the recent years remained at a fairly low level, so 1.1% uh, last year. So there was quite some dynamic, expected dynamic missing. Then Argentina in 2019 elected a government that has implemented a partly left-wing agenda, but in reality also avoided, uh, at least in most cases, to, to overly implement anti-market policies. That's at least uh, our view. The government also advanced in the negotiation of the debt agreement with the three main bondholders, which was successfully concluded, but um, of course the underlying issues of Argentina still need to be resolved in a, in a sustainable way. So talking a little bit about the BSF development in 2019, we have uh, as BSF been operating in South America for, for more than 100 years. So uh, we are clearly committed to the region long term. We've been there, we've uh, dealt with all different types of governments uh, and uh, economic situations and uh, during that term have also been um, quite often uh, be very resilient on, on crisis management. As a very broadly diversified chemical company, um, we depend on uh, our economic environment, obviously, and uh, therefore, of course, with the COVID uh, crisis, this has also been affecting uh, BSF in South America. We moved out of the crisis in, in 2015 and, and 2016 with a cultural transformation program, uh, and that may sound funny, but um, to bring really the entire organization closer to the customer. We'd say, okay, um, you're a big company and, and, and you should be always thinking about the customer, but uh, no, we, we made the customer really the entire attention of everything that we do internally to understand their needs. Um, uh, we then also drove digital business models uh, during the last years. And uh, our company has uh, a, a great reputation for being very innovative. Uh, and that is also something where uh, the creativity that you find here in South America has helped us a lot to really find solutions, great solutions uh, for the, uh, our customer needs. We've also engaged uh, in significant mergers and acquisitions. And um, uh, just to name um, the last three that we did, uh, we bought a, a company called Chemital, which is a, a surface treatment business, um, which uh, has automotive exposure, which also has uh, airline exposure or um, um, yeah, airline exposure. Then we acquired uh, from Solvay a business for performance uh, pol uh, polyamide uh, and which was uh, by far the largest acquisition, um, significant parts of the uh, crop protection and seed business of Bayer um, that uh, they sold when uh, they went together with Monsanto. So all of this, the uh, innovation, the mergers and acquisitions, the 
quite dynamic, BSF dynamic uh, uh, development that we've seen has led to significant growth for BSF in South America in the last years. And in 2019, we saw, for example, a an, an sales increase of uh, um, uh, 16%. So this was uh, quite significant uh, for us. We also had uh, very optimistic expectations for the year 2020. And uh, still in the, first, um, uh, in the first quarter, we had, despite of little tailwind that we had in the, in the economy in South America, we, we started very well into the, into the first quarter. The entire first quarter, just at the end, it, uh, it started to dip. Of course, the increasing COVID wave uh, coming first from Asia, then to uh, over Europe to the, to the Americas, um, manifested itself in South America uh, and changed this, this picture completely. While our own GDP forecast for Brazil still in February was about growth of 1%, this number moved to minus 1% in March to minus 4.5% in May and minus 7.5% in June. So um, we have clearly understood that COVID is, uh, is not a sprint, uh, it will be a marathon. The business, I, I mentioned already, BSF has a very broad business portfolio and um, here we had um, different developments. Some of the businesses were impacted very negatively, others even positively. Uh, and to give you some examples, due to the demand collapse, uh, the automotive industry has come basically region-wide to a standstill in the second quarter, with operations being reinitiated re really at a, at a very low level. Also. The plants that have, have automotive exposure um, at BSF have basically come to a complete standstill and have now gradually moved back to some, uh, to some uh, um, occupation. Other markets like, uh, for example, decorative paints. Um, we operate here in Brazil a, a very nice business, which is uh, our souvenir business. It's decorative paints. You may know the brand, great brand. Um, also here we have been facing uh, lower demands and uh, this was particularly widespread due to the reduced consumption um, because of also the, the lockdowns. But also here we've seen um, some, some recovery. The crop protection business is a, is a seasonal business with um, rather a focus on the, on the second half and we expect this business to really um, continue reasonably stable despite the COVID uh, situation. And then we have home care and hygiene products, which, uh, and pharma, uh, and, and nutrition, uh, and those have been facing uh, a significant additional demand. Uh, maybe it's temporary, but this uh, was clearly above our initial expectations. So, let me come to a, to a short outlook um, for the time after COVID. And as mentioned before, it, it will take some time to really return to the pre-crisis economic levels. And uh, here it's difficult uh, really to predict how quickly this will go because there are expert, expert estimations which range from economic downturn between uh, recovering in 2021, others speak about 2024, but uh, it really depends on, on the waves that we will be seeing. Will there be a second wave? The first one has, hasn't even come uh, to a stop. Uh, and of course, things like the, re, um, the a reliable vaccine, this will be absolutely critical for, for any type of recovery. So let me, instead of talking, uh, about the economic picture, uh, talk a little bit about what we see as what will be different after COVID-19. And uh, two trends, they are not unique for South America, I have to say, but we clearly uh, see this also here in the country where 
Uh, we also as BSF have gone down in a, uh, in a home office um, uh, mobile working environment, uh, basically mid-March, uh, and have not yet returned and will also um, not return in the near future. We are pushing the, the timeline for getting back to our offices uh, always further, so we will not be back in the office before the end of uh, September. And that depends on how the pandemic situation is, whether it will be really September. But we have seen, uh, we've seen this. Um, so remote work, um, several companies from, from tech to industrial goods have already announced plans to give uh, their employees uh, more flexibility. And uh, the COVID stress test showed that employees do not, have, do not have to be in the office all the time to work efficiently. And in BSF South America, we have already established prior to COVID a program which is called uh, Equilibri, where we have elements of um, uh, mobile uh, home office, of mobile work, of uh, shared desk, of uh, flex week, flex day. So a lot of flexibility that we offer to the uh, to our employees, which has served us extremely well during the COVID crisis now. But this also may shift even further towards mobile working in the future. We'll see. We're not there yet. And the second uh, trend that uh, I believe is uh, very important to mention is uh, digitization. So in South America, uh, BSF, we have understood that digitization uh, will be a key factor in, in, in the future. And we have um, launched uh, as a chemical company um, the first Black Friday uh, for chemical products chemical products here in South America. We have also created a digital shop, an online shop to, to buy uh, chemical uh, uh, products. And we have launched um, our Onono. Onono is our center for scientific and digital experiences. Um, and I have to say, during the COVID, we have encountered so many, so many opportunities for digitization and we have we've had digital customer visits uh, digital and virtual product launches virtual trainings of course we have even had di uh, digital wine tastings and beer tastings with our customers uh, and we discover new things by the day and innovate uh, to really organize and digitalize our our day-to-day -day work so so this, so this crisis also served to, to innovate or to create new ways of living and to interact and digitalize and also to have some fun. At Definitely. Least. Definitely. Um, yeah. So um, uh, I, those are two trends that will, that will, that will um, remain. And I'm personally very convinced about the long-term potential of the ecological potential and also the economical potential of South America. Um, it's just that uh, with the current um, economic, health, partly political crisis, um, this, uh, this potential, the realization of that potential has probably uh, been pushed a little bit further into the, into the future. That's what I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much for the time. Um, looking uh, very much forward to our chat uh, afterwards and the other presenters. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your presence. I think it is a good and broad overview about so many um, other industries that you get in touch with, like you uh, talked about mm -hmm. aviation, automotive. It is um, a, a special situation, even a crisis in, uh, worldwide. for the big manufacturers and OEMs, right? Mm -hmm. And we yeah. see this also in Germany, for example, but also in America, etc. I think it's a special case, the automotive industry, but you said also about home care and construction sites that you feel across your souvenir um, business. And of course, home care, hygienic um, is worldwide with COVID uh, a, good, um, mm -hmm. a, a good thing. But you talked also about innovation and M&As. 
and um, talking and as a way to grow and to move forward and to become bigger or to have strategic um, um, strategic aims uh, when you do M and A's, right? And so you can join forces with interesting companies. Um, mm -hmm. And I think. Um, um, this is a good uh, point, right, Augusto? I see you are ready there, ready to start. Yeah. Maybe what, what people have to look, what, what companies and decision makers have to take care of if they decide to go for an M&A, mm. mainly in this area of technology, right? You wrote also an issue about it. In this um, technology theme, um, we were talking here about digitalization, and of course, there are also completely digital companies at the moment popping up or even already active for some years. And then, and companies that do not have it maybe want to um, merge or acquire some companies in this tech um, business and industry. What can you tell us about it as a lawyer and a specialist for so many years already at Vedan? I'm very curious. Yeah. And please do not forget the Q&As. I made a, a question for all of you there. How, what do you think? Do you My, my, my pleasure. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for your time and for joining the session. I see that uh, Mr. Eurypus is very optimistic, which is good. Uh, that's the kind of vibe that we try to spread around as well. Um, look, uh, the idea here is, uh, I mean, I have heard lots of things that uh, Mr. Rubens has mentioned, and very familiar to me as well, that you know, some of them are really the kind of uh, um, um, perception that I have. And the idea here is just, you know, from my perspective, I'm a lawyer. Uh, corporate and M&A uh, have been doing that for at least the past 20 years, and uh, you know this is the kind of thing that uh, we sense very, very closely as well. So you know the trends that he mentioned are pretty uh, similar to what I have seen as well. I uh, just moving on. I have a presentation here that I'll try to sprint through uh, for the benefit of everybody. But uh, first of all, I mean who we are. I'll not spend time here. It's just we have a full service law firm in Brazil four places uh, here, uh, we'll have access to that afterwards and you can, you can check us online as well. Uh, then you can get to know uh, who we are. But uh, first of all, what is the current M&A landscape? I mean, what, what we are perceiving? We have here, maybe it's too small for you to, to, to see, but what we see was a sharp decrease in M&A activity in Brazil. Uh, if you compare year to date this year uh, to, to 2019, a sharp decrease. Um, we had, uh, I think it's 40, 46% or so, 40, almost 47% in terms of uh, amount involved in M&A and a number of transactions uh, minus 21%. Uh, it's certainly affected by the pandemic, no, no question about it, but the good thing is we already see a trend upwards, right? I mean, if you check the numbers for July alone, it's, it's still below uh, uh, 2019 figures, but already a good recovery. Just for instance, we had July 104 uh, transactions in, 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 in June 89 and in April 75. So it is already uh, a, a very uh, clear recovery, at least that's what we, we count on. And uh, in that overall M&A scenario, we see also here um, uh, that technology plays you know, the, the most important role. Um, you see we have a technology here representing um, maybe a third of all of all uh, transactions. And we also see here that's a share per country, and we are talking about inbound investments in Brazil. Uh, you see the U.S. Uh, leads still in the technology sector, uh, followed by, Germ by Germany. So uh, for all our German-speaking community here, that seems to be a very clear uh, indication of where uh, um, uh, um, you are looking at when, when uh, uh, client targets in Brazil. Um, uh, it's it's also um, quite quite usual to see technology M and I mean, we had the big tech deals of the past, but today we see very innovative and very uh, disruptive uh, technologies, and these are most usually associated with smaller companies uh, or companies that are startups, really. So there is a, a big focus of of venture capitals and also the corporate venture, of course, so the big big companies like the ISF or or you know the other big banks, for instance, they are looking very carefully into technology assets as well. Uh, but that's why we see a big chunk here um, uh, of technology deals being done by venture capital. 
So in terms uh, let's deal up the scenario. I mean, uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So where do we stand today? And 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 liaising a little bit with what Bettina has just said. I mean, what we I mean, technology was always there, right? Technology was always there. Companies were looking at that, and the fact that you know the pandemic struck, you know, made everybody that had plans for five years, for ten years. They had to strike their plans for in three months or four months. Uh, so uh, uh, the urge that the pandemic gave to technology, or the importance that it added to technology, technology has also always been important. But uh, that 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 urgency was really was really remarkable. And, and you know, companies, even companies that are not really tech oriented, but they need to have, they felt the need of adding some tech element to their business so that they keep track so that they you know find new niches where they could invest and try at least to to uh, minimize the impact of the pandemic on their on their performance so that's really what we see uh, uh, today so the, the really the need of the business is to to navigate the pandemic navigate these years of crisis that are uh, that we have now uh, in front of us and that we will have uh, uh, in the near future so that's where we see Technology has really been very, very important in terms of m and activity. Uh, and um, also in terms of sectors, affected sectors. I mean, uh, everything remote. I mean, we are just as uh, BSF in Brazil. Uh, we are also here still on, on, on remote working and everything around, around remoteness uh, is really key today, right? So um, e-commerce, I mean, if you, if you check the, the deals of the past year or so, the past 18 months, you'll see that um, in technology, most of them are associated with commerce, uh, digital infrastructure. I mean, Mr. Rubens also mentioned dig digitalization is inevitable. Uh, and it, it is very clear from the deals that we have seen. Uh, uh, simplification of supply chain and all that uh, is really uh, aimed at uh, making the, the, you know, the, 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 the path from the, from the company to the customer shorter and more efficient uh, is really uh, a core. Uh, of course, healthcare, uh, uh, e-learning is really a big, big trend, you know, especially when you are not um, uh, able to go to school or to the university or to, to get your education. E-learning is really uh, uh, moving ahead very fast. So these are really the most important, the most important uh, um, um, trending, really the trending sectors that we see today in our activity. So, uh, what is relevant? I mean, when we're talking about tech and a and that's a little bit more technical, I'm going to dive into something more technical here, but really very, very relevant. What is it today in a remote world and, and uh, um, technology intense world that is core? Certainly intellectual property technologies, essentially intellectual property software, uh, and also data, right? When, when someone needs to do things remote and needs to do uh, uh, needs to access things from remotely, you know, data is evolved. The world is data driven and it will be even more uh, data driven as, as, as time passes. So these are two topics that I think when looking at uh, and tech m &A, you really have to be very attentive to. So the first one, and I'm not trying to be exhaustive here. It's just a little bit, a few concerns or things that come up uh, in our experience that are worth mentioning here for for the benefit of this audience here. First of all, I mean, IP, right? Uh, IP is really important, uh, especially from a bias perspective. Uh, it's, you know, the attention, the level of attention that you give to IP aspects uh, in an m and uh, is much, much uh, bigger and much more intense than you would give in a regular m and for instance. And um, one kind of concern that we have especially as regards trademarks and patents, for instance, is that companies that have uh, um, very essential, very fundamental of their business, uh, the part of the business represented by IP that, you know, they, that the purchaser sees everything. Uh, we have faced cases where, you know, a deal was closed and uh, at the end of the day, one realized that the seller did not disclose all uh, 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 intellectual property that was relevant for the business, so we had huge earnout discussions eventually. So that's a that's the kind of risk that will leads us to really uh, 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 recommend a very very close examination of of IP 
there are some some issues related to registration offices, patent and IP registration, trademark registration offices in Brazil. They are not uh, all up to speed on whatever has you know happened or in the ways that that IP has been negotiated or licenses agreements uh, struck or entered into. So these are a full, a fuller uh, a fuller analysis. It's really important here. I would say it's almost as as intense as uh, we would see in really a high diligence case, right? So this is uh, very important from a patent and trademark uh, perspective. From a software perspective, software is developed by people, right? With the assistance of machines and computers, but at the end of the day, you have people behind. And these people can be uh, employees, can be third party service providers, can be you know, a joint developers. So what is important when you look into a, a software company is that you make sure that the company has all title, all rights over the software, and that nobody will come up in the future claiming things, claiming rights, claiming participation on whatever uh, software is, is core to that activity. So uh, what we advise is, okay, look very carefully on the arrangements you have with the employees. Make sure that, um, that you uh, um, have uh, uh, access or proper assignments of all rights related to software so that you know you have a very solid uh, software base on which to develop the company first by the company that you're relying on on proper uh, accurate information that you will have no problems or face no problems moving forward when when growing the company and another very important aspect is interaction with the party technology especially small people uh, sorry small businesses we see uh, that sometimes they have a business model that relies hugely on, on platforms from other big tech. Like uh, we have faced uh, uh, issues concerning WhatsApp or even Facebook or uh, Instagram where the interaction of the technology that the company uses uh, to sell, the interaction of this technology with the limits and, and restrictions imposed by, by the, this big, especially social media, they are not compatible. So at the end of the day, the social media company can simply say, no, you are no longer, can block really uh, 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 that player from, from offering services or products uh, with the assistance of their platform. So this is the kind of risk that comes up quite often and requires really very, very close attention to it. Um, right, so that's, that's what I've, uh, the And also those big, and also those big uh, platforms, right, react sometimes differently in different countries, right? Sometimes there is an issue in That's exactly it, especially in Brazil when we have very active judges, you know, that issue different different decisions in different directions. But that's precisely, first, the, the interaction between the tax, right? And second, uh, the, the overall analysis of what is the legal framework here and to which extent it can really affect um, the, the, the business, the development of the business in the way it was originally planned. Um, now, uh, this, that was for IP and software generally, now data protection. Um, I'm not sure if all of you are, are aware of where we stand today. I mean, we had since, you know, maybe almost 10 years now, we had specific or some general, actually, general uh, concepts of data protection built into our uh, internet law. But uh, in 2018, Brazil introduced a new uh, data privacy law. That's what we call LGPD. It's very, very similar to the European uh, GDPR, uh, and uh, that law uh, requests or imposes on companies generally the adoption of specific uh, uh, policies concerning the treatment of data. So again, when we talk tech, when we talk remote, we talk data, and that's the, and that's very new. So there are companies, tech companies, in the past that developed their their business uh, on 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 based on specific assumptions that will change or are changing right now. Uh, so the companies need to adapt. Uh, the tricky thing with the Brazil, Brazilian data privacy law is that uh, it was supposed to enter into force in the past in February, but due to the pandemic, the government tried to postpone the coming into effect. And, uh, you know, it would be next year, but more recently due to approval by the Senate, it's going to enter into force now. Uh, there's still doubts, it depends. it's just requiring uh, sanction for, sanctioning from the president, but depending on how it, it, it works, how it's done, 
it can be effective starting in September now, or it can already be effective starting as August, which is a tricky thing. But uh, the good thing is that alleviates a little bit of the concerns that the administrative sanctions will be will be uh, imposed only uh, uh, as of August next year. Um, so th there is some room there for the companies to adapt. So in attack m &A, what are the aspects that we should really look at as concerns uh, uh, um, uh, data privacy, right? The first one is really uh, make sure that um, uh, companies are uh, the companies are um, uh, doing what they need to do, uh, make adequation plans, uh, checking exactly what is it that, you know, to which extent they uh, are compliant with the data privacy uh, uh, principles that the law provides, whether the use of data uh, that they are doing uh, fits into the, the, the categories that uh, the law provides. So uh, these are this is really the work that companies are uh, carrying out right now, and that really relies needs to rely a lot on on legal advice because at the end of the day we assist uh, the data privacy teams we have here in the firm again i do corporate m a but we have a, a specific marketing and data uh, privacy uh, practice here in the firm um, they're very very busy right now very busy because these these plans require some diagnosis some identification of loopholes and gaps risk matrices and so on so that you know the company needs uh, knows eventually what needs to be implemented so that's at the end of the day, uh, designing, identifying, and setting uh, up a policy for the company. So this is the kind of thing that we did not, uh, maybe until two years ago, we did not look at when doing the due diligence in a, in a buy side too, but today it's one of the most important topics and, and, and more so uh, for tech companies. Uh, another a very important topic, but you know, it's still uh, not because the law is you know, starting to, to, to come into effect right now, we don't see that that much, but the kind of things that we would look at, and even more so in the future, is really breaches of that. I mean, what kind of data breaches the company has suffered, um, you know, in its existence, misuse of data. We know that sometimes data is not used in the way that the law would allow, and sale of databases. That tends to be uh, really uh, one of the most important aspects that the new law will, will um, uh, will uh, prevent or will really uh, uh, restrict. Um, and uh, right, I mean, what is the, 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 the takeaway from this entire analysis? We need to make sure that, you know, the interaction of tech, the tech is there, the interaction of tech is uh, with data is, is good and it's, it's compliant um, so that, you know, you can know exactly what kind of risks that might uh, 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 leads the business to, or in which way you will be able to protect against those risks. And I'm, I'm do we still have time, Bettina? No. <laughs> okay. Just you know, just a, a, again, you'll have you have uh, you know some transaction concerns that you know these uh, these issues lead us to. Just you know, what what is important is that the uh, is that the uh, the big picture. Uh, the due diligence work will be very important that you know investors have a big picture of where the risks are and try to uh, uh, um, determine how to address those risks. So uh, some of it will affect valuation uh, and will uh, end up in a purchase price negotiation and some of it will just you know need to be dealt with in terms of reps and launches very usual in M&A and indemnity. So uh, we would only look at you know sufficiency mm -hmm. and fitness aspects here in order to enhance the, the comfort of, of, uh, of purchases uh, when investing in a tech company. And on top of that, and that's my last comment, it's very usual for us to see uh, right now optionalities, you know, earn out provisions, just make sure, especially because of the pandemic, you know, companies are starting to recover. So, um, you know, for the benefit of the purchase and also the sale, make sure that, you know, everybody benefits eventually from uh, normal uh, business. Uh, so that's the kind of things that we have seen mm -hmm. in M&A January and more so in tech. Yes. So that would be my, my contribution today. Sorry if I extend a little bit, but Bettina, feel free. Yeah, because we have still have Dr. Alexander Pöppel with us. Thank you very much, Augusto. I think it's very interesting. It's very similar to what happened when compliance, the new compliance law came up, that you have to take care of it, even if you think it's very dry as a businessman because you want to make business, sell your products, um, do new projects, and then you have to take 
care very closely on those legislation and also the risks that is implied uh, there. That um, thank you very much. I, I adore. I really love that very clear um, design of your. Uh, PowerPoint. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. And as I see, there are no more no questions, no urgent questions. I would um, like to invite uh, Dr. Alexander Hüppel to our floor today. He is from Ortevu, uh, account manager, and located in uh, Munich in Germany. Exactly. And will thank talk you, to Bettina. us and, today and about the like system to integration and also SAPI or SAP or the SAP and you. And of course, we also see a lot of opportunity in Brazil and Latin America in general. Uh, however, in many cases, our job starts when the decision to invest has already been made. And um, since we are focusing on consulting in the context of uh, regulatory issues, on um, rollouts and maintenance of, of SAP or SAP um, systems, and we have focused um, on, on those issues exclusively in Latin America. And why is that? It is due to the complexity. And in my talk, I will give you an insight into at least some issues um, what makes Latin America and especially Brazil so complex and why this could matter for any M&A activities. So, um, <laughs> yeah, that's great. I, I thought that, um, yeah, a, 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 um, a, a happy audience is always a grateful next, audience. Uh, for, um, so we will start I have with to say some good news. <laughs> yeah. And the good news is in Brazil and Vietnam, the time to comply with tax obligations actually fell by 20, uh, 23%. And if this is not good news, I don't know what good news is. However, that raises the question how complex um, Brazil still is. And to answer the question, I have yet another question for you. And the question is, let me get to the next slide. The question is, what have Somalia, Venezuela, Chad, Central African Republic, Bolivia, Congo, and Brazil in common? Well, obviously, they are all interesting countries to visit. However, I would prefer Brazil in this case. But they have also something else in common. Um, that is, according to the ease of doing business ranking of the World Bank, they all rank in the top 10 countries uh, with the highest complexity for paying taxes. And Brazil is on the 184th rank. And um, the same uh, applies to other Latin American countries. It just shows how complex um, Latin America still is, and especially Brazil. And in this chart, you can see it for um, yeah for for a comparison of, of comparison of the, the different regions. And South America is ahead of everyone else. So um, and and not only yeah because of. Um, um, yeah, complex, uh, complex taxes. We'll get back to that later. But also um, due to some other reasons. And the first reason is something that especially Germans can understand easily. And um, that is that Brazil is also uh, yeah um, influenced by a yeah one could say culture of bureaucracy. And the the main root one could say of the complexity today is the 1988 Brazilian Constitution. And the Constitution treats the municipalities. And you have 5,000, more than 5,500 municipalities, and as part of the of the federation, and not simply as dependent um, subdivisions of the states. Yeah, if if that sounds familiar, yes, especially for Germany, since we have something comparable to that with the lender. Um, however, the the current Brazilian taxation system, which was introduced in in 1988 and granted power to federal, state, and municipal uh, governments to collect taxes. And this is where most of the um, complexity comes from. And just to give you a, yeah, a, a small overview of the complexity, I mean, for the Brazilian listeners, this is not something new, but maybe um, for, for some of the, the, the listeners from other countries, here you can see a, yeah, a basic overview, one could say, of the different um, taxes and, and tax re returns on the three levels that you have to take into account when, when it's about paying taxes in Brazil. And um, of course, this is not only about the different kinds of taxes, but you then have also taken into account how these taxes are calculated, which, for example, here we have taken the ICMS, the Industrial um, Tax on, on State Level, 
um, as an example, and the, 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 the ICMS in general applies to the movement of goods to service of transportation between several states and or municipalities and the tele telecommunication services. However, as you can see, you always have to um, yeah um, have to have to take uh, yeah into con uh, into consideration what your business exactly looks like, what kind of business you are doing, with whom you are doing that business, and with whom I mean especially the movement of goods between states or sometimes something changes in the production, and then a completely different um, tax uh, logic one could say applies. And this is why uh, the, the tax system in general is, is so complex here. And then you also have the different report obligations. And these are just the, the um, SPEG obligations, which means the tax reports on a federal level. And the main goal of, of SPEG, of this whole system, is to consolidate the reports. And we will see how this develops in the future. We've been talking about the tax reform a lot in, in, in the past years. and. Um, this year, again, there's, there's more discussion about it, but we will see how, how this develops. I mean, some say this will be a policy of, of the small steps and there won't be a, a huge change um, yeah, in, in, in short time. So um, this is what, what makes, in general, we, we could actually, not me, but some of my colleagues could talk about that the whole day or for about one week, but this is something you really have to be aware of, especially Especially also when you think of, yeah, think of merger and acquisitions because for your whole investment planning, this really is important since it comes with with some effort to to um, to cope with those challenges um, with your system. Might be SAP, for example. However, let's get back to the good news. And the good news we started with was that um, the time declines. The time that you that you um, need. However, you can see that we are still talking about, and this is on, in, on average, 2,500 hours back in 2013. Now it declined to um, 1,500 hours roughly, and that's on average. However, the main reason um, uh, was that, uh, or was due to the um, dispatch ECD, which was a, a um, to some extent, a huge change since the digital and electronic accounting allowed you to um, to send or to to compile a lot of information and send it to the tax authorities, say us, um, digitally. And that just yeah was one of the reasons why the the time has has declined since then. So, but it's still yeah quite complex. Another point I want to yeah, just, just name here is e-invoicing. And e-invoicing is um, an interesting topic for itself since for a lot of Europeans, e-invoicing just means digitizing, means making the world a, um, a little uh, less complex. And one could say that this will change in the future as well since the mandatory B2G e-invoicing is something that is happening in, in a more um, European states, it, it will come in, for Germany as well, and for Brazil it is very, very complex, um, which means you have a, a, all kinds of different, um, yeah, different requirements you, you have to take into account, and it also means it, and that um, when you do not, when, when there's some, um, yeah, um, when you do not have the, the certificate for, let's say, you want to move goods, you cannot move goods, which means a, um, a e-invoicing that um, doesn't work, and there, there's some and there's some mistakes or anything doesn't work. It means you cannot move your goods. Yeah, um, and, and which means you cannot move your trucks, and you lose a lot of money. So it's a good idea to take into account the complexity and also different possibilities to to cope with that, and. Um, yeah, at the, since this is our you know, main um, perspective here, what does this matter for M&A? I mean, some things are just quite obvious. I mean, first thing is you have a lot of compliance risks. If you might be a merger, might be an acquisition, if you um, have not um, taken care of all these requirements, then, yeah, it just can be, can be very costly for you. 
um, because of, of the fines or because you cannot move goods or whatsoever or because you, you realize too late that there's a lot to do system-wise to, to cope with all these requirements and, and to be compliant. Then one could say that there are also some opportunities and op with opportunities I mean um, because it's so regulated and the state wants to have so many information, of course this information should be also available to you and you can use it to analyze what has been happening in, in the past years. Um, by, for example, analyzing the, um, yeah, the electronic invoices, the system, how it is at the moment, etc. And, of course, the, the cost for tax compliance and system implementation really could affect your general decision. Not just if you invest, but how, what it also means in the upcoming years. How much personnel do you need? What personnel already, already exists? Is there a know-how? What is optimized in, in, in a system, what has not been optimized yet, and last but not least, and this is something that I would like to, to highlight, a lot of the processes that you would usually use in, in let's say, your, yeah, you're just what, for doing your business and also in your system, for example, SAP, have to be changed due to the regulatory requirements. And this is some, something that really has to be um, um, sought through um, uh, yeah, uh, at, b before you actually start, um, because in the end it's, it's, very, it's very hard to, to cope with that if you, if you didn't think it at the very beginning. And I give you an example for what we are doing um, before every project. It might be a, an analysis of an of a existing SAP system, it might be just a request for information for a rollout roll project, etc. Um, you always yeah, what you always do is you um, you analyze what the business scenarios um, yeah, actually um, are, and and that sounds that sounds trivial, one might think, but uh, I just give you an example, and the example is, for example, what we do in our request for information. Of course, we ask, and this is just a um, um, one of the points or one of one of the the topics that we that we ask clients about. Please find out exactly what you are obliged to 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 do there to be compliant. Uh, might be about tax reporting, might be about the whole um, topic of e invoicing, and um, dependent on what kind of business you are doing, this can um, yeah this can the, the the effort or the differences in the effort can be really huge. Which means that if you haven't done any any production so far in Brazil, maybe there is a merger acquisition whatsoever, and now you have production, completely changes the whole, um, yeah, the obligations and all the requirements that we have talked about before. And um, this is another, or can be another opportunity. That, for example, is a an analysis we did for a client, and the client actually thought that he had a fully integrated SAP system, and then found out, well, okay, there are still, yeah, some things that we should do, these are the, the red um, the little traffic lights here and where the client just has not been uh, compliant. And um, there was, there was some, some room for improvement, the yellow lights. And this is a, a, a good way, especially if you already have a, an SAP system or if the system exists, to find out what has to be done uh, to be done to, um, to be compliant. And the, um, yeah, the challenge in Brazil as well as in other Latin American countries also is that you have a, a, a lot of uh, volatility, which means that you have a lot of legal changes, um, like just for example in Brazil, we always do it for um, the past 12 months, um, and yeah, we didn't do it for, for the COVID times now since that changed a lot, but for example, last year we had roughly about 350 OSS nodes um, just for Brazil, and OSS nodes um, are the yeah um, OSS nodes is, is an online SAP service portal and that provides up to date information um, on SAP nodes and um, like bug fixes and some changes patches changes due to regulatory changes for example and that means that it can have a day with like ten OSS nodes or something and this is really a yeah um, impacts how you're doing business there how you trying to cope the, the regulatory requirements with your IT system. And because this is so complex, we focused exclusively on 
Latin America, which means we are doing that from Mexico, which also has some yeah, very um, challenging requirements, also a quite complex invoicing, and also tax system. So if you have any questions um, yeah, before investing <laughs> or after investing in, in, in Brazil, let us know. Okay, thank you very much for this um, explanation. I think it's very good uh, prepared. Thank you really very much. I see no question here, but I think we are also almost um, on the 60 minutes are um, almost past. But we have all the contacts here. Um, everything will be shared to, to everybody. I think uh, Brazil is a complex um, country, or at least you have to know it before, right? So you can prepare for it. Um, we heard some very good um, state of the art, really on the pulse of the time. A comments on Brazil from Mr. Manfredo Rubens of BSF, a long time already in South America, in uh, responsible there for the business of um, BSF. Augusto Souza um, from Veirano also very specifically um, explained to us what are the risks and what you ca should take care about. Um, Aish, um, I don't know, do you have any questions among yourselves, um, uh, my dear, very um, honorable guests, um, maybe Manfredo or Augusto or um, Alexander, do you have any comments or questions among yourselves? Maybe if I could maybe? make After one, one this, comment, uh, Bettina. This, or um, are you not, uh, uh, do you leave it We've to heard in the presentation a lot about the, the difficulties of doing business in, uh, in Brazil uh, and in, in, no in Latin America, and that is definitely true. Yes. On the other hand, there are also many opportunities yes. to do business, and you should not get hung up by all the administrative uh, topics that uh, we've heard about uh, this morning uh, uh, to 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 get discouraged in uh, investing in South America. I, I, I absolutely, absolutely, and uh, we, we sense that a lot because we have lots of foreign clients as well. Sometimes first time investors, and we grab them by the hand. Yeah, I think this is a let, very uh, nice conclusion. Yes, it Augusto, works, but it's certainly worthwhile. I mean, at least. You know, we have a very, very nice track record of successful investment. So that's that's very true, Mr. Rubens. Very, very true. Yeah. So um, those are the. Uh, um, uh, we are the very best specialists for Brazil and for Latin or South America or even Mexico, isn't it, um, Alexander? And so just talk to us, ask your questions, search us in private if you want. And the other thing that I don't want to forget to mention, I shared with us the, you the link of our annual conference um, that will be on, held on the 24th and 25th um, September, I saw already that Augusto already um, registered for it, and there we will analyze also the situation on the economic um, perspective um, from um, from the German or even from the Latin American view. We will talk about digitization. You can see that on our, our web page. We can talk about digitization. We will talk about healthcare and also the business there, even after COVID. Um, there will be a speech of Mr. Heiko Maas and also the uh, Minister for Economics of uh, Germany will be talking, Mr. Um, Peter Altmaier. And I think this is very nice to keep Latin America in view of the other world regions um, really um, actual and really um, sharing um, opinions and business views on this region. I think this is very important. And if you, if you saw what Alexander presented about this comparison of world regions, this is also something that investors look um, for. And then you have to look at the detail and also talk to us as we are all in this um, region and say, do not get afraid of it because it is good. It is still a very interesting market. And our hearts, of course, always are with um, Latin America and today especially with Brazil. 
uh, for the business and for the economic perspective on the web conference on M&A, uh, mergers and acquisitions. There's opportunity and just one more for the consequences side, of if, the crisis. If you're not a member of the LAV yet, become uh, this, one, because and then, and then you always have the right support for all much. the questions yep. for, for things like that. Yeah, I wanted to show you also this um, this um, my, the 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 website from the um, it's really impressive with the picture of all all of our speakers and uh, just uh, meet us there. There will be a lot of space of networking and it will be very interesting. A lot of people of Latin America also participating. So we have always both views on very critical themes. Also, um, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for our listeners. Also, I see. Most of them stayed with us up to um, uh, the end. Now, um, 69 minutes passed. I see that, uh, ah, here it is. Thank you very much, Adriana. Um, we, I managed to share. And this is the um, Latin American Day on the 24th and 25th September. If you scroll down, you have an overview about the program and all of the speakers and have a look. And come to see it and register yourself. I think it's also very nice for networking. That's why people come into the business and meet new business partners um, that are so competent and experts like the three we had with us today. Thank you very much for your cooperation, all members of the LIV. And directly from Sao Paulo, Thank from München. Um, and stay healthy, stay with us, and talk to us ever, always when you